I, I saw this and I just had to put this on because it's <laughs> it really typifies the way that the system works. A claim not contested stands true. Silence is consent. A claim brought in law that is not contested or rebutted then stands true, hence silence is considered consent. Do you know that the fundamental reason that people get summary judgments against them is they fail to submit through the procedure of the court any form of rebuttal. I, I know the system is unjust, I know the claims that are unfounded, but if you don't use their procedures and stand there and believe that it is unfounded, you've just given them a free kick. If you want to see the system change, make them work for a living, finally. Make them work. Make them work to show how they justify what they're doing. Don't make it easy for them. And certainly don't allow people to promote systems that uh, make it easy for the system. If you want to make it easy in a magistrate's court or a, or a district court anywhere in the world, it is to uh, ignore this canon. So if one comes to a civil claim against you, you have two choices. Because when you go to that hearing, if the facts claimed by the claimant are not rebutted, then a summary judgment will be rendered, sometimes in five, ten minutes. You either have a counterclaim or you rebut those claims in their forms. If it is a counterclaim, very important. A counterclaim, and I'll, I know this is not directly here, but a very important issue counterclaim. A counterclaim never references their claim. A counterclaim merely presents the facts that may be used in another claim in a contrary manner. In other words, it is using the same events but presenting them differently. And by virtue of that, the judge is forced to make a decision between two claims. If you reference their claim even once in a counterclaim, then procedurally that claim is thrown out. It's a trick. It's a trick that they've used over and over. So, and warning, disinfo agents. And I say this because I hear this told all the time. Again, there are people who actually, believe it or not, actually are, are out there promoting incompetence. You don't need to learn the law. Just follow my five easy step process to going to jail. It's easy. If you hear people say, you don't have to justify, you don't have to defend, just ignore it, please, please interrogate that and be very careful about that. If you want the system to change, make them work for it. Don't make it an easy mark. Another canon. Authority is hierarchical. The law is hierarchical. It's not surprising that the first culture, the centre of our culture, is religion. It actually is one of the first key bedrocks that separate us from pre-civilised cultures to civilised cultures, is to recognise that we are more than what this is. And that, in essence, for want of a better word, is, is religion. So it's, it's unsurprising that divine law is the highest form of canon law. The laws that are allegedly transmitted from some other realm, or sometimes found on gold tablets, <laughs> or stone tablets, uh, but divine law that, that, that speaks of a higher purpose, a higher being, a, a higher way of living. So it's the highest law, followed by natural law. When we mean natural law, we mean the laws of physics, the laws of science, that we are flesh vessels, that I will die, you will die, we will all die eventually. These are natural laws. Interestingly, <coughs> in the last hundred years, you find our brilliant bar people, our brilliant lawyers, trying to wiggle a few of these positive laws into natural laws. Have you heard natural person? Well, that's a complete and utter aberration, an absolute perversion. What they're trying to do is say that person, a fiction, is part of the natural kingdom of laws. I mean, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And positive law, of course, here is then the base. And when we're in positive law, admiralty law, maritime law, administrative law, contract, international, are all forms of positive law at the lowest form of law. So do you see, not only is canon the highest form of law, 
but there's a structure to canon law as well. Making sense? Okay. Here's another canon. All property is a right belonging to a trust. It's one of the hardest transitions in imaging to go from the realisation that you don't own the physicality of that car. You ha own a right to use the car, but you can't own it in the sense that you see it as a physical connection to you. <clears throat> I know there are some kids around Sydney w would vehemently disagree with me <laughs> that they are physically attached to their cars. But an example here is a house. You can't wrap your arms around your whole house. You can't hold it. And a rule of, of ownership, a rule of possession is if you can't possess it, you can't hold it, then ultimately you can't really own it in that sense. You can own the fiction of the house, the fiction on a piece of paper, the right of use, a title or whatever it is. But you can't own the physical. Because we're talking about fictions here, one of the great achievements of the disinfo age of the last 30 years is to put up a giant beware of the dog sign whenever we venture into the world of fiction. Fiction's bad. Fiction's the problem. No, the world is a fiction. Remember life is a dream? We have nothing to fear about fiction. Nothing to fear, except fear of itself and, and ignorance of how they use that against us. There's nothing intrinsically evil about this concept of the trust. It's only when we don't know how it works and we don't know how they've used it against us. Does that make sense? So in our daily lives, we deal with hundreds of trusts associated with property, whether we realise it or not. And we create them dozens of times during the day. Dad, can I borrow the car? Sure, but don't smash it. Here are the keys. Well, you've just created trust. You've just created trust. Can I, you know, can I borrow your DVD player? Sure, but I need it back by Thursday. You've just created trust. So it's that simple. But because trusts are an intrinsic element of the way property as a fiction works, they don't want you to know this. They don't want to know you to know this. Because once you start down the path of knowing this, then you start seeing the essence of their structure of financial law, of property law, and what they're doing to you when you ultimately go near their courts. I love this picture. <laughs> The first trust was created in 1302 by the Roman cult. Uh, if you've heard Santo, Santo uh, used a lot of this information that we researched from, um, from uh, Eucadia, and I thank him for, thank him for getting it out there. Uh, so let's look, at a, let's look at a real trust now, the first trust created in history and how it works. Okay. Uh, if you haven't done it, I really suggest you go and do it. It's a great thing before probably someone takes it down. But this is the official coat of arms of the Franciscans. The Franciscans were created by the Venetians. And the whole history of the Franciscans, including Francis, is unfortunately a huge myth, sadly. Because uh, I kind of liked the story. I thought the animals and that. We are the animals, by the way, if you read the story in Francis. Loving the animals. We were the animals, yeah? Um, but that's their crest. And I put that crest up because, you know, I said, and you agreed, that they, they, make, they don't hide the, the, who, who they claim to be in charge or who they are. They don't hide it from us. They don't need to. M most people, as we saw in the Matrix film, they don't want to know. You, you talk to them and say, would you like to know? They say, no, don't tell me. Don't, don't want to know, right? So they, they have no problems about that. If you look at this crest, and it's a bit small here, that's why I say go and have a look for it. You'll see the three crowns of the three trusts that are created, and you have the whole structure there of the, of the uh, Roman cult, the Roman Catholic Church, which they created. And you've even got, if you have a look down here, this is a classic. You've heard of the Jesuits, yeah? You'll hear people saying the Jesuits are in charge of the world. And you might hear, well, who created the Jesuits? Well, the Jesuits were formed in Venice and the Jesuits are part of the, uh, the, the ruling elite. Well, they've got a flag there. They actually have a flag there. And the flag 
is the flag of the Jesuits as part of the crest of the Franciscans. They even tell you who's in charge. They even tell you. If you hear people on radio and around, they go, oh, no, 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 the Jesuits aren't an order of the Franciscans. Oh, no, the Venetians didn't create the Jesuits. <laughs> they don't hide it. They tell you. So we put them as the executors. The Venetians, through the Franciscan friars, created this trust, and the trust expressed through papal bull, Unum Sanctum, claiming the whole world is subject to the pontiff. The beneficiary are the Christians down here. The trustee is the Roman pontiff. And over here we have the grantor. It's not Jack, it's God. <laughs> God entrusted the earth to the Vatican for safekeeping, yet somehow entrusted his executive powers to Venice. I, I still don't know how that worked out. But uh, that's the first trust. Here's another type of trust, a testamentary trust. So you've obviously heard of a will and testament, yeah? It's one of the few public service announcements that the bar does, or you need a will. They tell you you need a will, don't they? You, you, you know why you need a will? Because if you don't have a will, uh, then you're in probate. What they don't tell you is that you have uh, two, est two estates, effectively, you're creating. A testamentary trust, testamentary estate, and when you were born, they created a, a sister KV trust, a life estate. So unless you structure your will accordingly, that you have these, this life estate and this testamentary estate, then they get you on probate when you die and when you're alive because you haven't given instruction on how all this mess works. They've created a mess and they won't explain to you how to make it work. But they do say you need a will. They don't say how that will works. So a testamentary trust, the form of trust where the testator, you, expresses verbally. That was that auricular thing again. That's where the word testamentum comes from. That's what it was. It wasn't called a will. It was called a testamentum in uh, the Roman history, and then memorialised via a testament, so that upon the death, the property is managed accordingly. So you write a will, you pass away, the will says who's the executor, the executor, the trust comes into play, and all your property is in there, the trustee is appointed by the executor, and then there are a set of beneficiaries. Which is why <coughs> in the role of the general executor, you'll hear a fairly feeble response, but Nonetheless, it's a response you might hear. People say, you can't be the general executive because you're not dead yet. Well, that's true for the property that is visible in my estate now. But I have a life estate as well. I have a Sesta KV estate, which you're not letting me see. I know it's there because you give me a birth certificate with my name in all caps. I know it's all there. It's all around me. It's in plain sight, but you just won't admit it's, it's there. You won't tell me the truth and I can appoint a general executor for that because the judge in court is claiming to be the executor of that estate in my name. Uh, first testamentary trust was created in 1455. So we have some of the usual suspects, some new suspects that come onto the chessboard. He is the pontiff again. So now the pontiff is the grantor, granting rights of use from that wonderful unum sanctum. And then appoints an executor. The executor is the Roman curia, it's the government. So it's the elite roles within the Vatican. The trustees are the College of Cardinals and the beneficiary is the prince over papal land, the first crown. Remember I showed you the that uh, coat of arms of, of Venice, the Franciscans. There's a series of crowns there in amongst the ivy or the olives. Well, that's the first crown created there. Okay, thanks.